Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Lu Ngo, coming to your ears from Narm, Melbourne, Australia. Let's learn together. Hima Kay is a social psychologist and best-selling author of 22 books. He has also received many honorary doctorate appointments. He was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia in 2015. Today's topic is kindness, and we are going to explore it from the aspect of the transformative power of kindness. Let's get started. Thank you so much, Hugh, for being here. This is actually our second tech, and I'm very excited to finally get this going. Um, we had a lot of internet issues last time, so hopefully this time it's going to be really smooth. Um, and you and I both got sick uh, while we were waiting to reschedule, so this is going to be um, like a slow recovery into it. And I think the topic of today kindness just really feeds into what we have been going through because you have been so kind throughout the process even though you know we had many issues we tried different things that didn't work out and then you decided that you know what we can reschedule it's okay yeah. and even though you're still recovering you're, you're still joining us i think that's uh, probably the best thing about this episode we can coin it the you know the the kindness uh, even though you're sick kind of episode. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm very excited about today. And um, I've already got so impressed by your bio and you know your career journey so far, but I thought it would probably be fun to also let you introduce yourself a bit more from a more human perspective. Um, is there any fun fact we should know about you? <laughs> uh, well, the, I, I suppose the fun fact uh, is that I write novels as well as non-fiction books. And most people who read my non-fiction have no idea that I also write novels. Um, in fact, I'm working on a novel right now. Uh, and, that's, and that's something I really enjoy because it's a way of bringing all my uh, research, knowledge and experience uh, into very human stories. So, so my novels are all about human relationships and why we do the things we do. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction, Hugh. Uh, what a great start to the morning. And I'm very excited to learn more about the topic of today, which is kindness. I'm actually very curious about another thing before we go into the fun part of getting to know you more, which is the topic of kindness. You know, why did you get into, uh, you know, studying about this topic um, and, and writing books about it? And how, why did you decide to join us today to talk about it? You know, I see a lot of passion and we would love to understand why. Uh, I do have a lot of passion about this topic because I think uh, many of the problems that we're facing in contemporary society come from the fact that we've forgotten that our true nature is to be kind, cooperative, respectful uh, towards each other. We've become obsessed with our own identity, with our sense of individualism. And I think we just need to be reminded. And of course, things like a pandemic always do remind us uh, what it really means to be human. So that, that's, that's what I, my mission at the moment is to remind us of what it actually, actually means to be a human being. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's very inspiring for everyone to hear, especially after such a tough time. Um, I think now let's get into the fun part of it because it's it's actually um, the very start of our tradition, which is a section we call, Have You Met Hugh? So are you ready? We would love to hear some recommendations from you. Mm -hmm. Yep, off we go. Great, okay. The first thing is, what is a book you would recommend? Ah, there's no doubt about this one, Lou. Uh, I mean, I, there are, I've got thousands of books that I love, of course, both fiction and non-fiction, but the book that I've probably referred to most 
uh, is a book called On Becoming a Person, written by the American psychotherapist Carl Rogers. Uh, it was published 50 years ago, but it's still in print. Uh, and it's a collection of Rogers' essays uh, about psychotherapy, but more broadly about human relationships and communication uh, and how, uh, how to connect with each other. Um, so, that's, so that's called On Becoming a Person. Yeah, the title itself is already very, very intriguing to me because I definitely find it such an interesting concept to say becoming a person. You know, we're all, you know, we're all calling ourselves, each of us, a person. So I am curious to learn about that. I love reading, so I'm definitely going to put that on my reading list. Thank you. I suppose, I suppose it could have been called on becoming a flourishing person or becoming uh, a fully formed person because <laughs> we're all yeah. persons. You're right, yeah. but, uh, you know, there's something yeah. a bit higher to aim for. Yeah, that's quite aligned with the work that we do here at LMSL as well. So I definitely resonate with that and would love to give it a read and find out um, if there is room for learning and, you know, definitely applying some of that insights. Thank you. So that's the book. How about a movie that you would recommend or your all time favorite? Yeah, again, uh, which out of hundreds of movies that I've loved would I pick? The one that has probably stayed with me most is again quite an old movie. It came out in 1988 called Cinema Paradiso, um, about a young boy growing up in an Italian village who gets enchanted with the local cinema uh, and befriends the uh, um, the operator, the projector operator. Um, and of course, it was the first movie to have a soundtrack written by Morricone, who went on to become a very famous writer of film scores. So. Uh, it's still around. I strongly recommend Cinema Paradiso. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like a great recommendation and will be a massive throwback. So I'll definitely check that out. And uh, you mentioned this last time we chatted. I found it very, to be very interesting. Uh, you said you recorded, you've recorded a lot of podcasts, but you don't actually listen to any. Um, yeah. So <laughs> now I'm curious uh, uh, about a podcast that you would recommend. And if you don't really, uh, if you actually, like you said, you don't listen to any podcast, then which one is the favorite one you've recorded so far? Uh, well, uh, this one so far, of course, uh, this is going beautifully. <laughs> uh, but most of the podcasts, most Thank of the podcasts I've, I've done before have been uh, book podcasts. Uh, there's one in particular called Books, 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 uh, which uh. is hosted by Nicole Abadie. Uh, yeah. And she's uh, conducted uh, a couple of really lovely interviews, strictly about books that, when they were being published. So yeah. I'm, I'm a sort of a book podcast person, um, but I know there's a whole world of podcasts waiting for me to engage with when, when I finally have the time. Yeah. Oh, that sounds wonderful, especially talking about books. And you've written 22 best-selling books so far, and I think that will be a very interesting topic to discuss a bit uh, later in this podcast recording as well, because we've got a lot of questions about kindness, and I know you write books about kindness. So I'm excited about that. Um, next question we have for you is, who is your famous role model? Or if not famous, then who's your role model? Um, yeah, well, I have a few. Um, I'm certainly not a famous role model is my primary school teacher uh, from years five and six, Miss King. Yeah. Miss King yeah. was an extraordinary influence on my life. I had her for two years. Um, and I've since met a lot of people who went through her classes and they all feel the same way. She was a remarkable, it was a co-education class never any suggestion of any kind of discrimination between boys and girls. But the main thing about Miss King was that she just assumed we could all do everything. We didn't think we could draw or write stories or sing or dance. In Miss King's class, everyone did everything and we discovered that we could do all those things. So in terms of inspiring me to have a go, to become something better than I thought I was, um, Miss King is, is is the role model. Uh, in terms of famous uh, people, I mean, there are so many out there. If you if you were looking for a role model uh, for humility, you couldn't look much further than Nelson Mandela. 
for wisdom, I'd go back to the ancient Greek philosophers like Plato and Socrates. Uh, for kindness, I think probably Jesus of Nazareth is, uh, is my role model. Uh, yep. And certainly for insight into what it means to be human, I, I return to Carl Rogers. Yep. Oh, so the many about, amazing role models. The thing about all those people is they're a mixture. They're all flawed. Uh, yep. They're not just one thing. No one is just wonderful. Everyone has to deal with Uh, the shadows as well as the light. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing about this list of wonderful humans bundled together uh, as your role model. And, and you just exude that energy of, you know, a lot of a lot of kindness to you as well. So I think that makes total sense. And um, I think the last one is probably the most interesting one because um, you've done, I, I would say, probably a lot of courses in your early days and then you've taught a lot of courses yourself. Um, mm. So which one would be a favorite course that you've completed if there's one that you've learned, you know, a new thing that you learned recently? Uh Well, it, it, it goes back with formal courses. We're going back to the 1950s and 1960s uh, when I did a, an undergraduate degree at, at Sydney University, a, a Bachelor of Arts. Uh, never a full-time student, by the way. That's one of my few regrets yeah. in life. I, I never actually had the opportunity just to be a student, so I was always working and studying at night. But that Bachelor of Arts was a, an absolute a uh, life changer for me, both psychology and philosophy and English. I did a wonderful course in English language and literature, uh, which has stayed with me and which inspired me really to uh, ultimately become a writer. Oh, that's so beautiful. I haven't uh, had the chance to read your books yet, but I'm definitely re really keen to read them and, you know, find out a bit more about that history and background, because I'm sure a lot of the things that you've learned will be uh, shared in the books and the writing writing style as well. That's always interesting to notice. Mm. Yeah, well, amazing. Uh, the, well, the, the, the place to start is with my latest book, Lou, which is called The Kindness Revolution. But also, yeah. there, are, there are two other books uh, over the last 10 years which I think I'd, I'd recommend if someone had not read any of my books. One is called What Makes Us Tick, which is looking at the, at the social desires that drive us as humans. And the other is yeah. called The Good Life, uh, which is yeah. all about what, what makes a life worth living. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not a recipe for having a good time, but it's a recipe for having a life characterized by goodness. Amazing. So I'm just making notes right now as we're speaking. So I'm, I could actually get these books. I'm, I've been getting a lot of new books lately. So these are definitely going to go on my list. Thank you for that. Um, fantastic. So that is our first section. Have you met Hugh? I'm sure we've got to know you much better now, especially for me, just hearing your stories and, you know, the history of how you've gone through life and, you know, your studies, your professional careers, kind of like you, you get a sneak peek into each and every one of that in your answers. Um, the next part is now the actual insightful part of this conversation that I'm excited to learn about. And, and last time when we were, you know, trying to do the recording the first time, um, I had a sneak peek into that and I thought it was amazing already. So I'm very excited to hear about the rest of what you have prepared for today. Um, our first question in this show is always about happiness because, you know, that's what this show is about, you know, with the happiness and the science behind it. But we also know that happiness means different things to different people. So to you, Hugh, what does happiness mean? Yes, I, I prefer the word wholeness. When I think of happiness, um, I, we can talk a little bit about why I avoid the word, because in the, in the modern usage of the word, I think it's been rather trivialized, and we can talk about that. But when I think about happiness, I think about deep life satisfaction. I think about becoming a whole person, um, of engaging with my humanity. Uh, and I go back again to the ancient Greeks. I mean, they, they had a word eudaimonia, uh, which is generally translated as happiness. But what they meant when they talked about uh, eudaimonia, happiness, or my word wholeness, they, they, they were talking about things like doing your duty as a citizen. 
uh, fulfilling your sense of purpose, making sacrifices for the common good, um, uh, suffering uh, in the interests of other people, um, uh, nurturing virtue, this kind of thing. So this is not what we often think about when we say happiness, but I think we get hints from, from the ancient Greeks about a pathway to deep life satisfaction and the sense of wholeness. So that's what it means to me. Yeah, I love that definition because um, it is a very wholesome way of looking at it, pun intended. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, to, to a lot of us, happiness means, um, let's say, feeling happy all the time or, mm. you know, like reaching th that high all the time. And um, if we're feeling low, that means we don't have happiness within us. And I think that is untrue because like you said, it's, it's about, you know, the wholeness the, mm. of, of being in this life. And I feel like um, that is actually a good segue into the second question we always ask, which is uh, about the misconceptions when it comes to happiness. Um, and this is because we all get some things wrong when it comes to happiness. And so to you, you know, based on your observation, your work so far, what would be the main and the biggest misconceptions that people normally get when it comes to happiness? I think, I think the confusion between happiness and pleasure is the biggest mistake uh, that we make. People assume that uh, happiness is all about feeling terrific, being euphoric positive emotions, positive outcomes, and especially a sense of pleasure. So when people say, I'm not getting enough pleasure out of my life, why aren't I happier? Well, happiness in the sense that I was talking about it has really got nothing to do with pleasure. There might be satisfaction and there might be pleasure sometimes, but there are plenty of occasions uh, in which we'll behave well uh, in which we'll be fulfilling our duty as humans, we'll be making the world a better place when we won't necessarily be feeling pleasure as a result mm. of that. I think that the big mistake is to, is to privilege happiness in the emotional yeah. sense, as though that's the best of the emotions, when in fact all the emotions are teachers. Every, every point on the emotional spectrum has something to teach us, and our folklore says we grow through pain. Let's remember that that what we sometimes think of as the negative emotions, pain, disappointment, failure, loss, uh, these things are powerful teachers. And I think we have to remember that happiness, even in the emotional sense, uh, only makes sense if you think of it in the context of all the other emotions. Uh, and, and in fact, you wouldn't know what happiness was if you hadn't experienced sadness, uh, you really have to, you have to experience the full spectrum to be fully human. And that yeah. being fully human comes back to my idea of wholeness. So it's not about, it's not about emotion, it's not, it's not an emotional state. It's not about pleasure. Uh, yeah. It's about deep life satisfaction. Yeah. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think um, pleasure is always sort of falsely regarded in, in our cultures because um, if, if there's no pleasure, there seems to be no happiness. And I think that's yes. completely untrue because, like you said, it's about this wholeness of experiencing all the different emotions on the spectrum to be able to appreciate the pleasure, the happiness. And um, I feel like that is a message that needs to be conveyed uh, much more strongly nowadays because um, I guess we all grow up knowing and thinking that we need to find the next high or, you know, the next yes. pleasure. What is the next thing that's going to make us feel like we are happy? While in fact, mm -hmm. happiness is already there and uh, we just need to experience, you know, the all the emotions that come from that spectrum. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that's a really important observation, Lou. I think this idea of the pursuit of happiness when it means the pursuit of pleasure, that is a dead end. Uh, I mean, one of the things that, that philosophers um, of every age, religious leaders of every tradition have said to us, if you chase happiness in the emotional sense, you'll never find it. Uh, yeah. if, you want to, if you want to pursue happiness and pleasure in the emotional sense, pursue it for other people. What can I do to give someone else 
uh, a sense of uh, happiness or pleasure. All right, so we have now addressed happiness, some misconceptions. What about kindness? That's the topic that we're talking about today. But how do how would you define kindness, Hugh? I would define kindness. Well, let me take a step back. The context for my definition is to understand that we humans are social beings, uh, that we need each other, we need groups, families, neighborhoods, communities of all kinds to nurture us and sustain us. And therefore, our deepest need as humans is to feel that we belong, that we, that we have a place within the human family. Uh, we need to be included, we need to be appreciated, taken seriously. So I would define kindness as anything we do to show another person that we acknowledge them, that we appreciate them, that we take them seriously, that we include them. And that could be anything from just a friendly smile or a wave. <laughs> yeah, so, so anything at all we do to show another person that we acknowledge them, that we take them seriously, that we're prepared to listen to them, that we're prepared to notice them. I heard a terrible story about a young man uh, who had attempted to take his own life by jumping off a bridge. Luckily, he survived. But yeah. later, he said uh, to the person, uh, to the people who'd rescued him, he said, if someone had smiled at me, I wouldn't have jumped. Uh, in other words, no one was taking me seriously. No one was noticing me. Uh, no mm -hmm. one seemed to appreciate me. So kindness is whatever we do to show another person uh, that we yeah. do take them seriously, that, that they are that they are part of us, that we acknowledge that that I am you and you are me, that we're all one, uh, that that being members of a social species, we are hopeless in isolation. We need each other. The signs of that are what I'd call kindness. Yeah, I see. I think um, from our research into what your work is about, we also noticed that you mentioned kindness is one of humanity's most precious assets. And yes. this is exactly why, because you, you, know, you just walked it through the, the thinking behind why it is such a great asset. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, there's nothing else to add. Um, but I think the, the interesting part that comes out of uh, this um, sort of definition is because it's such a, such a big asset to us, and we are talking about happiness here, and happiness is such a big part in our lives. How do you see the relationship between kindness and happiness? Well, when we are, I mean, let's, again, let's just wind back a step. I think of kindness as, when I say it's our most precious asset, it, it's in our DNA. I mean, because we are social beings, we are, we are born, there's a cooperative center in the human brain that neuroscientists can actually identify. So we are born to cooperate, which means, of course, we are born to love. We're born to respect each other, to show kindness towards each other. It's absolutely natural for humans to show kindness. So that, that's, that's, our, uh, that's why I describe it as our biggest asset. Now, yeah. does acting kindly make you feel happy? Well, it doesn't necessarily bring you pleasure, but it does bring the deep satisfaction of knowing that you are being true to your human nature, true to what Abraham Lincoln, the American president, once described as the better angels of our nature. When we're being true to those better angels, and kindness is one of them, that's when we mm. experience the rich sense of wholeness, of flourishing, of being fully human, uh, having yeah. an understanding of what it means to be human. So uh, we can call that happiness. Uh, but it certainly flows from uh, acting kindly. And I think it's yeah. important just uh, on that, while we're on that point, to say that kindness itself is not about emotion. I think, I think it's important because we're talking about, in the same way as cooperation is not, a, we're, we're built to cooperate, we're built to be kind. We're not always kind, of course, our egos get in the way. But kindness is not something that we do because we feel something for another person. It's not an emotional response to someone else. Kindness is just being human. 
You know, the, yeah. the, the human being can't flourish if it doesn't breathe. Physically, yeah. it can't flourish. And emotionally, it can't flourish if it isn't kind. Hmm. Absolutely. I think that just reminds me of the story that you just told earlier, you know, about the, the man uh, or the person that jumped off the bridge. Mm. Um, just because of, of that lack of kindness, that probably um, we forget sometimes. And, and I don't know if uh, this is the meaning behind the story, but to me, it's kind of the analogy of our society because sometimes we just forget. And I think... It brings a lot of happiness when you exude that kindness to others and to yourself. And you can find that happiness within as well. Because I, I think how you treat others would kind of reflect how you're treating yourself. So if you're not exuding that kindness, it might mean that you're lacking kindness within. And I saw this from uh, my, one of my best friends. And I, I just think that it's so amazing that um, kindness is there, you know, and I think this, this is a great example um, about, um, I, I think it's a massive issue in Australia about homelessness. And to me, it's, it's, it's definitely like something that I was trying to learn more about and trying to navigate. But I remember um, one day my best friend and I, we were hanging out and we were just I think we were going to a store or something like that. And on the way, there was this homeless man who asked um, us for help. Um, and honestly, I didn't notice in that moment because I was probably caught up in the conversation. So I didn't pay much attention to that. Now, my best friend, on the other hand, he stopped and he started talking to the homeless man. And I didn't know what the conversation was about. Um, but um, turns out my best friend offered to buy him a meal because in Australia, as we know, there are a lot of homeless people and a lot of the time they just, they, they ask for money and then they will spend it on maybe, you know, smoking or uh, maybe, I don't know, a, a drink, which could have been spent, that money could have been spent on actual, you know, an actual meal. Um, and so my friend was actually exuding his kindness by um, offering to buy this person a meal. So they actually have something in their tummy other than, you know, spending money on something that would harm them. And I think yes. that act of kindness shows me that my friend actually has so much kindness in him. And that's, you know, it's, it's rare, um, first of all. And second of all, it was a beautiful thing to witness because mm. it was a lesson for me too. You know, I probably didn't notice because I, um, I was not as kind as I wanted to be. And um, maybe in that particular period of time, um, I was going through things that made me forget that I needed to be kind to myself and others. So mm. to me, it's mm. just, you know, a very interesting example of um, – all the things that you just mentioned about, you know, mm. being human, having kindness, uh, having that wholeness. Um, and just, it was just really wholesome to witness that. So I thought I'd share that story. Yes, thank you. Yes. And it's very true, Lou, what you were saying, that um, in order to be kind to others, we do also need to be kind to ourselves. Um, uh, um, there's an analogy. When you, when you get on an aeroplane uh, to go somewhere uh, and, the, and the cabin crew give you the safety instructions before you take off and they say you know if the cabin pressure is lost oxygen masks will drop down etc and they say yeah. always fit your own mask before you try to help someone else and i think that's an important little reminder that uh, yes we have to nurture ourselves as well we have to yeah. recharge our own batteries in order 100%. to be useful to other people yeah there's another saying that we hear so often, which is you can't pour from an empty cup, right? So that's exactly what we're talking about. That yes, you have to fill yes. your cup first and then yes. you'll be able to pour it to, yes. uh, you know, to others. And, you know, it can be kindness. It can be care. It can be love. can be anything. Um, yep. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a very, um, a very different topic from the usual, oh, let's, you know, find the next high and like, you know, find the next thing that's going to bring us pleasure. And actually, yes. no, it's not that, uh, you know, it's not that kind of figuring yourself out it's actually you don't have to add things or experiences all the time that would bring you the high perhaps sometimes mm. you need a bit a bit of you know a mellow experience to to see the wholeness of this life and yeah that's very interesting to me um 
And I, th- I think another thing that uh, we you talked about earlier, uh, let's go there because you mentioned your book. Um, and I think an, a time in our lives recently, you know, it's, it's still fresh um, and we're probably still living through it. I don't know if it's come to an end, which is this pandemic. Now, I know a lot of people like, let's stop talking about the pandemic already, but uh, we can't really do that because, you know, it's still affecting a lot of lives and uh, maybe is affecting ourselves without us realizing because, you know, it's, a, it's like a long term effect. It's not the physical health per se, but it's the mental health aspect mm-hmm. of it, too. And you wrote a book during that time, and you mentioned the book before, uh, which is The Kindness Revolution. So I just thought it's a very interesting topic that emerged from the pandemic, but it made a lot of sense too, because we needed so much kindness in that period. And uh, I would love to hear a little more about the book itself and and the revolution that you're mentioning, because um, maybe to to some people it's, clear you know like we always have kindness what are you talking about why is there why is there a need to have such a, re- a revolution so mm. Hugh let us know okay. a bit more about this and the revolution all right thanks Lou uh, and of course it's true that we do always have kindness millions of acts of kindness are being performed all over Australia all around the world every day because humans are being human But one of the very interesting things about Western society and Australia in particular is that over the last 30 or 40 years, there've been a lot of social, cultural, economic, technological changes that have been reshaping our society and pushing us away from our true nature. Uh, I'm talking about things like our shrinking households, our high rate of relationship breakdown, our falling birth rate, our increased mobility, um, our, our obsessive busyness, and of course our embrace of information technology, which connects us like never before, but also makes it easier than ever before to stay apart from each other. And many people are sacrificing personal face-to-face time in favor of screen time. So we we don't have time to go into all that, but if you put all those sort of things together, you can look at a society which is becoming more socially fragmented, some loss of social cohesion, and in particular, uh, a rise in the sense of personal individualism, uh, of my rights, my entitlements, a loss of the sense uh, or some erosion of the sense of me being part of a community, part of a society, even part of a species. But, but obsessed about who I am and why I'm special and why I'm different and why I'm important, whether it's based on my gender or my religious beliefs or my ethnicity or whatever it is. And all those things are important to our sense of self, but not yeah. nearly as significant as the underlying sense of our common humanity, that we are sure we are, we have lots of individual differences, but in the end, we are all one. We're all in this thing together. So that that's the context in which I wrote the book, that here we are, a species born to cooperate, born for kindness, care, compassion, becoming more fragmented, becoming more individualistic, as a result, of course, suffering what you would expect a species mm-hmm. like this to suffer when we become more individualistic, epidemics of anxiety and, and, of, and of depression and of loneliness, Mm -hmm. because we're herd animals. And if we start thinking of ourselves as individuals rather than as members of the herd, uh, and if we're cut off from the herd, then we do experience feelings of anxiety and depression and so on. So there's there's the background. But then we come to 2020, and we had a record bushfire season, followed by a pandemic, followed by record floods in various parts of the country. We've had a series of catastrophes. And as you say, the the pandemic is still going strong. There are still people dying in various parts of Australia from this pandemic. There are still people in intensive care. It's not over. But what has this done to us? What do floods do to us? What do fires do to us? What does a pandemic do to us? What does a depression do to us? And the answer is very easy to observe in human history, as well as in our own very recent history, 
which is crises and catastrophes tend to bring out the best in us. When we're facing a really difficult period uh, as a society, suddenly we remember what it means to be human. Oh, we better be kind to each other. We better help out. Oh, there's that old guy at the end of the street who lives on his own. Maybe I've got to do shopping. Um, we become more conscious of the needs of other people. We become in particular conscious of the need to make personal sacrifices for the common good. In the case of the pandemic, it might be staying at home or wearing a mask or keeping our distance or whatever it might be. We do that for the common good, even though it involves some sacrifice for ourselves. Um, so, so what a crisis usually does is remind us that we all exist in a kind of shimmering, vibrating web of connectedness. Uh, we can't escape from that. But sometimes we try to pretend that that's not true. Uh, but then a crisis brings us back into a full realization of the fact that we are all interconnected, that we can only in the end make sense of ourselves by recognizing that Yes, we are independent individuals, but at the same time, we are interdependent humans yeah. who need each other. And I think the lessons yeah. from the yeah. pandemic have been very clear. And Lou, I think that I mean, one reason why I'm delighted to be talking to you about this is it's vital that we don't let go of these lessons. Wouldn't it be sad? Wouldn't it be tragic? Wouldn't it be pathetic? If when the pandemic finally leaves us, we all said, oh, well, we got through that. Now let's go back to how we were. Let's go back to being selfish. Let's go back to ignoring the neighbours. Let's go back to being too busy. Uh, let, let, let's go back to pleasing ourselves at the expense of other people. Surely not. Surely we're going to take these lessons and hang on to them because they've been a vital reminder of what it means to be a human. Yeah. Wow. What a profound message. I think the whole message itself is telling me a lot about uh, another issue that I've kind of think I've been thinking about quite a bit lately, because you're talking about, you know, the individualism and the collective, the, co yes. the common community that we're in. It's kind of like a, I would say to me, uh, an identity crisis that you, now that you mentioned that. And I think it's very interesting because I come from a background of, you know, an, an Asian family that is always tight knit, always together, always doing things. And sometimes it might feel a bit too much. And then fast forward, I moved to Australia and then I come into this society of uh, individuals. It's very different. There's no such thing as, hey, are you unwell? Can I do something for you? Unless they are your best of friends. Mm -hmm. And I just miss that a lot. You know, initially I, I thought that, yeah, you know, like it's just it's a new place. It's so exciting. Everything is new and fun. Um, and then throughout the pandemic, that's what I remember and noticed because, you know, while my family was together, you know, going through the pandemic and caring for one another. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I was here by myself, um, locked inside a little apartment with my four cats, and you know, <laughs> didn't have, a, yeah, didn't have any sort of social interaction. Um, and and to me, it was like a time that all my friends just sort of also got into their own little bubbles, and, and we tried to of course, you know, get in touch um, using all the platforms that were booming in that in that time. But then I, I looked back on it now and, and I thought, you know, like I, I heard wonderful stories and, you know, witness and see a lot of stories about families that, um, for example, worked out together during lockdown so that they, you know, that's like their family activity and they have fun together. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, obviously, obviously I live here by myself, so that's not something that I could do. And we were allowed, you know, like a social bubble with a friend. And we could kind of do that. And that time actually taught us a lot because it brought me and my friends so much closer than before. Because before the pandemic, which is like, oh, you know, like I have this thing I'm going to do. It's like me, me, me. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I'm not going to prioritize the that, that, that connectedness of, you know, being kind to 
um, one another, checking in and actually feeling like you're part of a bigger family. Um, and perhaps it is different with people that, you know, have established lives and friends and families um, here. But to me, it was just very interesting going through that transition period of noticing how different things are. And um, in a society like here in Australia, I, I'm still navigating the different dynamics because obviously there are still a lot of Asian families here that kind of are really close. And uh, sometimes you feel like, oh my gosh, you're being um, you know, sort of looked into under a microscope and it's hard. But then there are times that you just find, find yourself completely alone. And, you know, like even though you're struggling, there's no kindness at all. Um, and yeah, like I've gone through all of those sort of lows and highs and I just find it to be very interesting because it feeds into what you're saying exactly. Mm. Um, yes, yeah. thank you, Lou. Uh, th that's right. And that's a, an important reminder that there are other cultures and Asian culture is a good example, where the, the ethos is completely different. Um, yeah. uh, in our criminal justice system, the worst punishment we can think of for a prisoner is solitary confinement. Now, during the lockdown, a lot of people experienced solitary confinement, and we know it's not good for us. It's not, you know, it's, it is a punishment. Uh, and, and that's why I'm hoping that this will be a trigger for thinking in a more communitarian way, for recognizing uh, that the sense of belonging is so fundamental to our mental and emotional health. We have a lot yeah. to learn from Asian cultures about uh, not just care within the family, but care within the community. We have a lot to learn from Scandinavian cultures. I mean, a very different sort of cultural background, but there, in societies where there's much more, much higher taxation, where people pay much more to ensure the care of everybody, people feel much more connected to the society as a result of that. Whereas here, we're always talking about cutting taxes and <laughs> contributing less to the common good. Uh, we're going to have to, we're going to have to rethink that. It's a very, yeah. it's a very interesting. Uh, we could go on all day about this topic, Lou, but I, just one little thing that triggered from what you said. Some research that was done in Australia by the Australian Psychological Society and Swinburne University before the pandemic hit uh, showed that 25% of all Australian adults report feeling lonely for most mm. of the time. 25%. Mm feeling lonely most of the time. And the loneliest, the loneliest uh, group within society was young adults in the 18 to 24 age group who are mm. also the most connected via information yeah. technology. So the screen is no substitute for eye contact. The screen is no substitute yeah. for touching someone or being close oh, yeah. and, and uh, you know, having actual personal interaction. So we've got yeah. to recognise that loneliness is now an epidemic which we need to address. Yeah. Oh, 100%. I couldn't agree more. Um, it's definitely, you know, a, a thing that I think it was pretty much an elephant in the room, but no one talked about it. And all of this ties back to being kind, right? And um, let's go into that a bit more because in your book, I think our, our researcher have uh, have read have read the book. I haven't, uh, but they have read the book and um, they've come up with some sort of breakdown into the most interesting parts of the insights you provided. And I think uh, they said here on the first page of your book, you mentioned a quote from Samuel Johnson. Kindness is in our power, even when fondness is not. Yes. And yes. Yeah. Can you can you talk about that a bit more? Because it sounds like yes. it's not the same thing as affection. You know, it's exactly. Yeah. I think this is a really central point for us all to ponder. It's so easy to think that we'll be kind to people who somehow appeal to us, or we'll mm. be kind to people we like or people we know. Now, I think of kindness. I mean, kindness is a, is a cut down of an old fashioned word, loving kindness. That's the real word. And loving kindness is a unique form of human love. Every form of human love is wonderful. Romantic love is exciting and familial love is, is remarkable 
and companionate love. Where would we be without uh, the affection of our friends? But there's this unique form of love which has nothing to do with emotion, has nothing to do with affection. I mean, when we use the word love, normally if we say, I, I love my family or I love dogs or I love this movie or I love that book and so on, we're talking about feelings. We're talking about affection, emotion. But when we're talking about kindness or loving kindness, to use the traditional word, we're talking about the only form of human love which does not involve the emotions at all. I think this is something we should celebrate, Lou. We belong to a species yeah. which is capable of showing kindness to people we don't like. We're capable yeah. of showing yeah. kindness to people we could never agree with. We're showing kindness, we're capable of showing kindness to total strangers, people we're never going to see again. But we can, we're quite capable of helping them out in a jam. We don't ask, we don't ask to qualify them. If you see someone who's dropped, dropped their shopping bag in a rainstorm and there's stuff everywhere, you just, you just help them out. You don't say, look, I can see you need help, but before I offer to help, I need to know how did you vote in the last election? You know, we don't yeah. do that. Yeah. Uh, we just help people because they're people. We're kind yeah. to humans yeah. because they're humans. We're kind not only to humans, to animals and plants and so on. Um, but kindness is part of what it means to be fully human, regardless of our emotions. I mean, that, that means that we're, you, can, you can discipline a child kindly. You can have a robust argument with someone kindly. You can listen to someone's point of view kindly, even though you know you don't agree with it, but you pay them the respect, show them the kindness of hearing what they have to say, and then, by all means, disagree. I mean, being kind is not being a doormat. It's not being a pushover. We can be kind and strong. You can terminate a relationship kindly. You could fire someone kindly. <laughs> Uh, it's a way of being fully human that's got nothing to do with the emotions. And if, the, if, if, our, if our listeners to this podcast took away one thing from our conversation, Lou, I think that this yeah. is what I'd like it to be, that kindness is in our, as Samuel Johnson said, kindness is in our power because we're human even when fondness is not. Nothing to do with your emotions. That's very different from compassion. Compassion, of course, is an emotional response to someone in need, feeling yeah. uh, some, some uh, uh, emotional response to someone. Kindness doesn't yeah. require that at all. Kindness, as I said earlier, kindness is just like breathing. Mm. Yeah, that is such a powerful message, honestly. I think um, it speaks to so many different circumstances as well here because um, – there will be times and there will be many, many times that you'll be in a situation where you just do not want to be kind to a person or a group of people because it's really, really hard because there's no, no such fondness there. Like you just mentioned, right? Um, yet we're all humans and, and we all need to exude some sort of kindness in the ways that we carry out activities. And I find it to be very interesting when you said, you know, be kind when you fire people, <laughs> you know, yes. even the worst of things could be done kindly. Um, that reminds me of something that's very funny that, that happens recently. Um, and, and I just find that there was such a lack of kindness there that I just found fascinating because I thought people would be nice in, in this, uh, those circumstances, but it's not. Um, and th this is a personal story from mine where, um, you know, I, I've been living in this apartment by myself for um, about over two years and I really like the space, um, but it's, you know, in the Melbourne CBD, so it's very expensive. Um, and because I got COVID rent, I was, you know, very happy about how it was. But then um, I, I got this inspection. I was talking to the agent and, you know, we were like having a really good chat about life and, you know, like life after COVID and just having a really good laugh overall. And everything was really nice. And then I was asking him, oh, you know, do you think the rent would increase? And he was saying, oh, no, 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 it'll be fine. You know, you rented in COVID. It would be fine. So this whole conversation was really nice. Fast forward about two weeks later, 
I received an email from him and it was just like this, you know, auto generated sort of email. It was, it wasn't even like, hi, even though we've discussed now the landlord has decided it was like straight up, hi, this is the market. This is your new rent. And I was like, what? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> there was no like forward into it at all. Uh, so I was emailing the landlord, uh, sorry, the agent. I was saying, hi, um, thank you for the email. But, you know, based on our previous conversation, the rent was going to be the same. And, you know, like prices and everything are already increasing. And I understand that. But to me, it's probably be a bit tricky uh, because, you know, you didn't give me a heads up. Plus, I have to factor in all the other planning that I'm doing. Um, and that was, you know, like when I was still working out my visa details and things like that. So I was like really stressing out. Um, and this guy did not respond to my email. And I was kind of scared because I was like, okay, he doesn't respond to my email. And this is a massive increase. It's not like, it's not even 10%. It's, I think it's like close to 20%, which is crazy. And I called him and then he didn't pick up and then I called him again. And then he's like, oh yes, I meant to call you, but I forgot. And I was like, okay, that's very nice. And then he would say, you know, he went on to say something along the line of, okay, so we, you know, we gave you the notice. Uh, we had to give you six, 60 days notice or something um other otherwise you know you can find another place and that was it <laughs> and yeah there was no there was no kindness in in saying that oh you know like i uh, apologize for whatever happened or you know like i understand it might be tough but you know there's always the option of finding a, a place maybe we can help you to find a place or something there was none of that there was just one sentence oh yeah yeah, the, because the market has changed. So, you know, you can pay or there's another option of just moving out. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, the, the two conversations were so different when um, there was nothing of an issue happened. It was like really nice. And then when there was something that was happening, there was no more kindness because it was not a fun situation for that person anymore. Maybe the fondness wasn't there um, anymore because I was asking to... I was asking them to reconsider. Now, eventually we worked things out, but to me, it was kind of like I was in the heat of the moment. I was like, I cannot stand this. Like I can pay the rent, but this is making me really angry. I'd rather move out than talk to this person. So I kind of had to calm myself down. Um, and it was now that you mentioned that I just realized there was no kindness from this person. But you know what? I'm going to be kind to them anyway. And um, yeah, that's what I chose because it's actually, it was really hard because, you know, like I could move easily and just yeah. not deal with them anymore. But I think it's just such a hassle moving. And so I decided that I would be kind to both myself and them and agree to meet in the middle. Um, but throughout that process, it was just hilarious because, yeah, it's exactly what you've been writing about in your book. And um, yeah, we, we definitely need to learn to do that a bit more right? in, in all of the different interactions that we're going to have throughout the day, whether it be with friends, family, you know, colleagues. Um, when, when you use the, the kind of language that's kind of like, you know, cut through and just there's no compassion, empathy, no kindness. It's just it makes other people's day so much worse. And in turn, you also kind of bring on that negative energy yourself, I feel. Mm. Yeah, that's a, a very graphic story, Lou. And uh, I mean, he's very fortunate that, that you chose kindness. <laughs> and don't underestimate the effect of that, because I think kindness is like dropping a stone into a pond, the ripples go out. If we act kindly, even in the face of unkindness, uh, yeah. the influence, the example uh, will will be instructive to other people. And by the way, there's, there is an, an important uh, other little bit of subtext in your story, which is we must remember that kind of, if we're going to if we're going to make a commitment to the idea that kindness is how we're going to be, we're going to be true to our human nature, we're going to be kind in the same way as we're going to breathe, then it doesn't matter whether people are kind to us or not. It's not a reciprocal thing. I'm not kind to you because you're kind to me. I'm kind to you yeah. because I'm a human. Uh, yeah. And that and that estate agent, of course, uh, was acting very unkindly, and there'll be all sorts of reasons for that. But that's typical of what I was talking about earlier, a society which has become more fragmented, in which people have become more self-interested, uh, more individualistic. Kindness is the casualty, and that's what we have to restore. Yeah. 
Oh, 100%. And, and we I won't, it won't be restored. It won't be restored by the government saying we're going to pass a, an act of parliament to say everyone's got to be kind. <laughs> yeah. It will only. It will only have the revolution, like all revolutions, will start with individuals in their own home, in their own street, in their own workplace, in their own dealings with the estate agent or whatever it is. One, one by one, case by case, person by person, the influence of kindness will gradually spread. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. I love that. And you're right. And there's no government that will uh, grant that act or, you know, make an act of uh, making sure you have kindness. Well, it's also hard to measure. Um, but I think it comes from within and everyone needs to learn about this because... I think oftentimes it's when something has gone too far and you look back and you're like, oh, that was very yes. unkind of me. I should have done this differently. Well, we can always approach it from the get-go and always come with the intention of being kind. And it's actually a really, really hard thing to do. And I totally agree with you. It's, it's you know, it, it's like a muscle because when we're in a situation where it's tough or um, when people are actually being unkind to us, choosing to be kind to them is taking a lot of energy out of you all the time. Um, and, and that needs to be acknowledged. However, it's also very, very important um, because I think, you know, it takes a lot of energy, but you're kind to yourself too. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, absolutely. And I think, uh, I think we've got to recognize that maintaining an attitude of kindness, thinking of kindness as the way of being in the world, uh, there'll be plenty of setbacks. I mean, we will stumble. And that's why I think we do need almost like a daily discipline that brings us back to the to the idea of kindness. Uh, in my case, I do it when I'm going to bed at night. I just take a few moments to reflect on the day uh, and say, now, when were the moments when I was unkind? When, when could I have been kinder than I was, I think the constant little reminder about that is going to increase the chances that I'll be consistently kind tomorrow. Uh, but as you've said, it also involves uh, a bit of time out, uh, a bit of not, not to be self-indulgent, but just to nurture ourselves, whether it's meditation or walking or singing or whatever we might do in order to recharge our own personal batteries. So we've got the energy, we've got the capacity to be kind. It's, it's a tough gig being a human, yeah. uh, being kind to other people all the time in every situation is demanding. That's why we sometimes need a crisis uh, or yeah. a pandemic or, some, or something like that to remind us that we're quite capable of doing it. So why don't we yeah. do it all the time? Yeah. Oh, so true. Well, it's always going to be a challenge, but I think it's a challenge that we should all accept and uh, definitely you know, run with it because it's, like you said, it's a revolution. It's going to change so much. Um, and uh, another thing that the our researcher noticed is in Chapter 3, you mentioned everyone's deepest need is to be heard. And you talk about um, responding to another person's need, you know, in a, in a serious manner. So can you give us a bit more context into this and how it yes. plays into the kindness revolution? Yes, absolutely. Uh, if I had to pick one act of kindness that's probably more potent than any other, it's the act of listening. It's what you're doing for me right now, Lou, and I appreciate it. Because when you listen to me, without having to put it into words, when we listen to another person, what we're saying is, I take you seriously enough to bother listening to what you're saying. I'm prepared to entertain your ideas, even though I might not agree with them, even though this might lead to an argument between us, which is fine, nothing wrong with having arguments, um, but, in the, but first, I'm going to hear, I, I won't be qualified to disagree with you until I've yeah. actually understood what your point of view is. So I think of listening as the great therapeutic gift we give each other. And if you want to, if you want to get another perspective on it, just think about what happens when you don't listen to someone. 
when you when you're looking away or looking at your watch or showing signs that you're not really listening to them what you're saying without putting it into words is i don't take you seriously enough to bother listening to you i'm not prepared to entertain your ideas now would you ever say that to a friend or to a child or to a neighbor or to a colleague you'd never say that it'd be too hurtful it'd be too offensive and yet when we withhold the gift of listening that's what we're actually saying we're actually saying sorry you don't count i don't i'm not prepared to acknowledge you even to the point of listening to what you have to say so think of think of listening attentively empathically to another person as one of humanity's most potent acts of kindness yeah, I, I totally hear you when you said um, being listened to and being taken seriously is like, you know, it's, it's one of the core things of, of being human is so important. And um, I think active listening is also a skill too, right? Because a lot of the time you don't need to listen to respond. You just need to understand. And mm. uh, yeah, perhaps there's no response needed sometimes. And, yes, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, that's right. Sometimes yeah. people only need to be listened to. Uh, yeah. In fact, I read a, a lovely book uh, from a medical practitioner uh, about this sort of subject saying, often all a patient needs is for you to be there listening to them, uh, particularly yeah. people who are approaching the end of their life. Uh, listening is hard work for us, of course. It's a, quite a courageous thing to do because if you really listen to someone, you are taking the risk of having to change your mind yep. in response to what you hear. And most of us don't like changing our minds. Most of us are pretty confident that we know the way the world is. So I've got all this experience. I've got my attitudes. I've got my values. Uh, you know, I think I've got, I've got my thinking straight. Uh, well, yeah. we have to set all that aside when we listen. We have to say, mm -hmm. hang on, I'm, I'm now just going to try to imagine what it must be like to be this other person, whether it's a child or an elderly person or a neighbor or whoever it is. What must it be like to be them? That's, yeah. the, that's the discipline we need to be good listeners uh, yeah. because when we listen, we are stepping outside the comfort and the security of our own little cocoon of prejudices and beliefs and so on, and we're out in the open running the risk of being changed by what we hear. That's the test of a good listener. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think being hurt as well, it's really comforting in, in many senses. And, and like you said, it's just that act of you know getting your stories heard or mm. getting listened to and i think to me being acknowledged you know whatever yes. it is you know get, getting that acknowledged is so important because yes. the listener of the story or of the situation they they don't even need to have gone through it or you know like know exactly what it is that we're going through but just having um, someone to say i hear you mm. i understand that is already like the, the best thing that anyone can do to, to exude kindness because yes. we don't need solution. I'm sure, I'm sure as humans, we can all, you know, have solutions for our situations, for whatever it is that we're going through. We just need mm. someone to know that, you know, that this is what actually happened. You know, this mm. happened mm. and it might not be pretty. It might, you know, be really bad. And yeah, you know, uh, a friend or um, a fellow human can say, I hear you, I understand that happened. And mm. That to me is already a really big act of kindness. Yes, absolutely. It's like balm to the soul, Lou. And as yeah. you say, it doesn't always need a response, just you've heard me, you've, you've understood, you've listened to me. You might not like what you hear, you might not agree with my point of view, but now I've been heard. In, in, work, yeah. in work situations, one of the things that people often complain about is that decisions are made that affect them, that they were never yeah. consulted about. Their point of view was never heard. Not that they necessarily wanted people to act on what they heard, but at least listen to me. Yeah. At least hear what yeah. I have to say. Often people in a relationship will say that, you know, he just doesn't listen to me. 
Well, yeah. that's like saying he doesn't take me seriously as a person. Because if we yeah. do, we'll listen. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's such a good point that you mentioned. And I think one of the the responses that always needs to come for it first whenever there's a discussion about you know decision made in a work context a family context a relationship context is i hear you i understand completely where you're coming from and it's not saying it for the sake of it but actually doing that um yes. is, is quite hard yes. to especially when you have so many different sources of information and if you have you know at least two parties in uh, in a conversation you'll have at least two different perspectives and um, what I have found as well, you know, in the work context is something that you're prioritizing and you need to prioritize, um, might not be something that your fellow colleague might prioritize and that's okay. Mm. You just need to mm. also, you know, both of you need to understand the different perspectives and then you come to a place where you can make a decision because that was when you need, there's no point in going around and around, you know, given the different perspectives, um, and, you know, not come to that conclusion. And that is also I think an example of being kind because mm. you know compromising is part of being kind right you have to compromise yes. uh, so, a lot of the times and uh, to be able to do that you're actually exuding that kindness okay I'm kind to myself mm. I'm kind to this person I'm going to compromise mm. absolutely right yes yes yeah. Um, so he, an, another thing that I think you mentioned, especially when, when we first chatted with you and invited you to join the podcast, um, is something that you're also passionate about, which is hope. And you talked about uh, kindness as uh, the power to also restore hope. So mm. let's go a bit more into that. You know, how would you define this relationship and how can kindness help to restore hope? Mm. Yes, I think when, when all hope is lost, uh, we're finished. Um, uh, we, we all need faith in the future and faith and hope are almost uh, inseparable. Um, but one of the things that gives us hope is knowing that we have a, pl a place where we belong, knowing that we are part of something, knowing, as you said a moment ago, knowing that we are being acknowledged and appreciated is the primary source of hope for us. When we feel as though we've been ignored, when we feel as though people are no longer interested in what we think, when we're being excluded, unappreciated, the, 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 the natural reaction to that is to lose hope, to lose faith, to feel as yep. though it's, it's hopeless. I, I'm nobody. Nobody's taking me seriously. When... The connection is made when an act of kindness, when someone reaches out and shows by listening or by some act of generosity or support or kindness of some kind, they're showing that actually we notice you, we appreciate you, we're including you, we're all in this together. It's like pumping up the balloon. The hope is restored. Okay, mm. I'm someone, I belong here, there is a future. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not hopeless, I'm not ignored, I'm not nobody. Yeah. Uh, and, that's, and that's transformative for people mm. who've, who've uh, sunk into despair. I mean, that's one of the, even if you're just passing someone in the street and you smile and wave and say hello as you pass them, that could have been a moment when you brought that, 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 that smile, that act of inclusive kindness brought them back from the brink of despair and gave them fresh hope. Okay, maybe there is a future. Maybe I'm not a nobody. That person mm. was really nice to me. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, ho hopelessness, despair, feelings of worthlessness increase when people are experiencing loneliness, uh, when they feel as though they're cut off from the human herd, restoring that sense of belonging to the herd. You're part of us. Come on. We're going to have a cup of tea. Come and join us or come and come and sing in my choir. Come and join my book group or come and have a cup of tea or whatever it is. This is not just about showing kindness. This is about restoring someone's sense that they matter. And that's the basis of human hope. 
Yeah, absolutely. What I'm hearing is when there's kindness, there's hope. And yes. honestly, that's so true because as you were giving all these examples and talking about the context uh, about um, why there's such a relationship between kindness and hope, I, I remember uh, the time, you know, like it's, it's, it's such an, an interesting time. And there was a time where I felt like there was no hope. Now, now that I think about it, given what you just said, I realize that time I felt like there was no hope because there was no kindness around me. No yeah. one was being kind to me. No one was helping. And I wasn't kind to myself either. So there was, you know, no hope or it was pretty hopeless yes. back in the day. Yes. Now, um, I, I, I would spare you the details, but I think um, that is such a big lesson about uh, us in this society and, and, and this communities of people around us that it's not just about being kind to each other, being kind to ourselves uh, and, and having that as part of your wholeness and, and your happiness. It's also about ensuring that there's always hope to do, you know, important things. Um, to some people, it, it can be, you know, merely living the next day and the next day and the next day, or yes. to others, it could actually be, okay, there's actually hope. I'm, I'm fighting for something that actually matters, or, you know, I'm, I'm going to continue working on this um, particular project or you know this organization because there's hope for it yes and uh yeah i, I think um that means that there might also be a lot of challenges and i think having the kindness that that we have been talking about here we, we've made it maybe we've made it sound a bit easy um and so i really want to also pick your brains on you know the different kind of challenges obviously we do want to have kindness because that will in, in turn to have uh, help us to have hope but i am i'm sure there will be a lot and a lot of challenges as we you know go through this process especially because you like you said it's a revolution um mm. what would be some of the biggest challenges for us as a society in your opinion to you know actually embed kindness in the way we do things and how can we go about solving these challenges mm. well the biggest challenge i think lou is that we are living in a society uh, which has uh, which has become rampantly individualistic. We're living in a society uh, which is encouraging people to focus on their differences, their focus on their personal identity, often at the expense of their sense of common humanity. So the big challenge for us is to recognize that these changes are happening around us. Even the information technology revolution represents a challenge because it's so brilliant, it's so convenient, it's so clever. It's making this conversation possible right now. But yeah. to recognize that all of these changes that have been going on around us have been at the expense of our sense of actual person-to-person -person connection with each other. All of the boosting of the idea of personal identity has been at the expense of thinking of ourselves as cooperative communitarians who need each other and belong together in, in, in herds. So it's a, it's a mental discipline of constantly reminding ourselves that th these trends are pushing us in the wrong direction. We can't hold back the trends. But we can mm. certainly be more, the challenge is to be conscious of the effect of those trends in our own lives and to resist that. Uh, yes, I am who I am. I'm a special, unique person, but that's not all I am. And I've got to remember the bigger bit, which is that I'm human and that I'm a neighbor and that I'm a colleague and that I, and I'm, a, I'm a, a, a citizen. I'm a person uh, who lives in this society, in this neighborhood and so on. Keep reminding ourselves uh, of the basis for human kindness, which is the sense of our common humanity. If we think of ourselves as individuals who are special, different, unique, wonderful, etc., what happens to kindness? Uh, then we're only interested in being kind to ourselves. Now, that's that's important too, but it's only we're only kind to ourselves to equip ourselves. As you said earlier, you can't pour from an empty cup. We've got to fill the cup, but we're filling the cup so we can pour from it, uh, not just so we'll have a full cup. So I think it's that push back against 
the so-called me culture, which has had us by the throat for the last 50 years, uh, pushing back against that is our greatest challenge. Yeah, totally. Thank you so much. And um, our final question is also related to the book itself. Um, the you know all the messages so far have been wonderful and really beautiful. But this one I think uh, might be challenging for some people to hear. However, I think it's important to talk about, which is something you mentioned in chapter six of your book. Life is imperfect. It resolves only in death. Now, this is a topic that uh, not a lot of people would want to talk about, especially because you know, there's death mentioned in it. Um, and and I, I think it's still very important and we don't have to dwell on it too much. But I would love to hear your perspective here about, you know, the fact that you mentioned um, death in this scenario and we're talking about kindness. Mm. Um, so, yeah, what, what would be the, the final message to our audience before we move on to the next part? Mm. Well, there, there are two things I'd say about this, Lou. One is... Um, the idea that anything is going to be perfect is crazy because humans are frail, imperfect creatures. The world is an imperfect place. Um, and the idea that a relationship would be perfect or that a child would be perfect. I mean, we have perfect moments, of course. But we've got to learn to deal with and live with our own frailty, our own shortcomings, our own imperfections and the imperfections of others. Nobody is perfect. And the expectation that they should be is one reason why we've become so ready to abandon relationships. Oh, it's not perfect. I'll drop this and start again. Well, the next one won't be perfect either. The only perfect state is death. When you're dead, you're perfectly dead. <laughs> I mean, and that sounds a bit, <coughs> a bit light-hearted, um, but of course it's true. Uh, until death, <coughs> we're dealing with imperfection. Mm. So that's that's the one reason why I brought that up. The other reason is that I think remembering that we are all going to die is actually a very helpful perspective on the subject of kindness, because if you read the literature of death and dying, what you do not find is that when people are approaching the end of their lives, especially if they know they are dying, what you do not find is people saying, ah, oh, I wish I'd made more money. Oh, look, mm. I wish I'd actually bought that car that I wanted. Uh, yeah. I wish I'd kicked more goals. Uh, that's not what they say. Uh, what yep. the almost universal human experience, when you get the perspective of looking back on your life from your approaching death, is to say, was I kind enough? Was I uh, a, a, a faithful partner? Uh, was I a kind and loving parent? Was I a good neighbor? Uh, th these are the questions that, that disturb people when they reach the end of their lives. And so what I'm suggesting is we should learn from that and bring the death perspective into our everyday lives. Let's not wait till we're dead or nearly dead to say, oh, was I kind enough? Let's make it mm. a daily practice, a daily discipline to say, yeah. was I kind enough? Not, yeah. not, not when I'm heart nearly dead, but now, when mm. I'm 30 or 40 or 50, um, each day to say, mm. I know what's going to happen at the end of my life. I'm going to be asking, was I a good enough, kind enough uh, person? I'd better start asking now, not, mm. post not, not postpone the question. Yeah. That is a beautiful message to end this part of the you know interview, and I think um, that is also a perfect segue into the next part, which is uh, now we're getting practical. We're talking about practice here, and I think what you're saying is every day we can set aside some time to actually ask ourselves, "Was I kind enough today?" Yes. Now that is a really really good practice. Not a lot of people 
have heard about it, I'm sure. I don't think a lot of people are doing this actively. So to those that are kind of, you know, hesitant and in doubt, what would you say to be the three good things about this practice? Why should they do this? First of all, it's um, it's time out. It's time for reflection, which we all need. We all, we all need, we don't want to keep rushing headlong. We all need to take time out for a bit of reflection, mindfulness, uh, being more conscious of what's actually happening to us. So it's got that reflective quality. It's also got uh, the benefit that I'm going to be interrogating myself about my own humanity. I'm actually going mm. right to the core of what it means to be human. I'm not messing around with trivial stuff. I'm, I'm saying I am human and what matters most at being human is whether I am kind to other people, whether I'm nurturing the life of the human herd, whether I'm making the world a better place. Uh, so, so it's got that value that it's going to the core of my humanity. But the third benefit, of course, is that it's going to enrich my capacity to be kind tomorrow. Uh, that it's act the, the, the actual outcome of it is not just that I've had a useful period of reflection. The outcome is my commitment to being kind in the world has been refreshed. Yeah. What great benefits we have there. However, I'm sure there would be a lot of challenges. You know, and I said before, you know, some people might be a bit hesitant when it comes to practicing this, um, especially on the daily. So, um, you know, from experience, from observation, what are the you know key challenges that people might encounter once they start doing this? I think one thing that I can see straight away is probably, you know, they will probably not going to do, do that daily because they forget or they're too busy. Uh, yes, it does need... Yeah. It does need a trigger. In my case, it's going to bed. Uh, mm. I use that moment <clears throat> of going to bed to say, okay, this is my time for reflection on, was I kind yeah. enough today? Um, mm. So yes, it, it's just a matter of choosing a particular time so there's a trigger. It might be after yeah. breakfast or you know, it might be sitting on the bus or something. The moment when this reminds you, this triggers the fact that this is, this is my kindness this is my death perspective on kindness yeah. moment uh, yeah. so that, that that is a challenge the other challenge of course is that all of us will know what that we've acted unkindly today and we might mm. want to avoid this practice because it's going wow. to cause us True. to have to face something about ourselves <laughs> that we're a little bit ashamed of a bit embarrassed about uh, but that's yeah. the whole point of the practice the whole point of the practice is to confront our own frailty, our own shortcomings, and to learn from them. We're never going to yeah. reach perfection. We're never going to get to the end of a day and say, oh, terrific, I was kind to everybody in every situation. What a saint. No, uh, but we're edging towards that every day. Hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. That's amazing. And um, finally, I think um, to convince people Yes, we know that we should do the other daily. Yes, we know that uh, you know, before bed would be the really good time. There will be challenges, but it's very important. I think this will convince people the most. How will this impact our perception on life and our level of happiness? Mm. Well, there's a direct relationship. Um, when, we're, when we're doing this kind of practice daily, uh, we are becoming more fully human. That is, that is increasing our capacity for wholeness and increasing our deep life satisfaction. So the benefits are there in becoming more fully human, becoming mm. a flourishing human rather than a half-hearted, self-centered human. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, so actually, uh, you, you said you, you try to do this before bed, but do you combine this practice with any other practice that might help? No, this is something I do just as a just as a, a standalone exercise. Yes. 
Wonderful. Yeah, that's also good because, yeah, a lot of the time people try to stack habits. So we're kind of, you know, we're curious to see if, you know, there's anything you're stacking with this exercise, like, you know, journaling or something like that. But yeah. Yeah, if it's a standalone practice, it might actually help people to say, oh, you know what, that's, that's not going to take a lot of time. I can do it. And right. yeah, just do it on the daily, yeah. have it maybe, maybe next to your bed and have a kindness journal, something like that. I think that'll be yeah. actually really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, I'm totally in favor of journaling, but I'm just suggesting that this practice doesn't involve anything as elaborate as that. It's a very simple yeah. moment mm. of reflection. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you for that mm. reminder. Then it's even easier, right? So there's no, um, there's nothing that's actually stopping us apart from, you know, making the, the short time for it at the end of each day. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. All right. So thank you for the practice. We've got, you know, all the insights. We've been really practical. We've talked a lot about kindness, wholeness, happiness, um, the different emotions in life and um, a lot of the challenges that will come our way when it comes to being kind, exuding that kindness. Now, before we let you go, we, we would love to have a final section, which is called Open Mic, where we invite you to talk about anything you would like to talk about. Um, it can be about the same topic, if you like, if you're super passionate about it, um, or if not, it can be about something else that you're also passionate about. So the floor is yours. <coughs> well, I'm passionate about a lot of things. I'm passionate about the, the value of choral singing. Singing in a choir is one of the, one of the, the great joys of my life. But no, I, I think what I'd like to concentrate on just for a moment, Lou, uh, before we wrap this, is just a reminder of something we have talked about, but I want to develop it just a little bit, which is that the greatest of all human needs is the need to be taken seriously. And mm. so if we are going to make the world a better place, the best thing we can do is find any way of showing that we take other people seriously. And by that, I mean the bus driver or uh, the person uh, that you're sitting next to on the train or your next door neighbor or the stranger in the street or the person beside you in the supermarket queue or anything, anything. Reach out to everybody. I don't mean necessarily strike up a deep and meaningful conversation, but with eye contact, with a smile, uh, sometimes with a conversation and always with a willingness to listen, do anything we can to show other people that we acknowledge them, that we take them seriously. That is the single most important thing we can do to ensure the mental and emotional health of the people around us. That's the biggest contribution we can make to making the world a better place. Do something mm. to show yeah. people that we take them seriously. Don't worry about whether people are taking us seriously. That's irrelevant. Our job yeah. on the planet is to take other people seriously. That, we, we belong to this social species. Let's act yeah. as if we really are connected to each other and acknowledge yeah. that whenever we're yeah. in the presence of each other. Yeah. Oh, what a beautiful message to end with. Thank you. I had goosebumps. I, I think that's... Um, something to ponder for sure. Um, it will take us some time to all digest that piece of information, but I think it's absolutely crucial that we keep that in mind as we go about our days, you know, like it's something to do on the daily. It's not like, yeah, okay, now I'm going to actually take things seriously. No, it's actually something that you walk around with. So that's yes. very powerful. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much for today, Hugh. And finally, before we let you go, do you have anything else you would like to share with our audience? Um, maybe a little bit more about your work, you know, where can they find out about you if there's any website or um, places where you would like our audience to know? Uh, well, there is a website, it's just hughmckay.com.au. Um, but the best thing is the books. Uh, if you If you go to the books, um, that, that's where you find uh, all the things we've been talking about, particularly the Kindness Revolution, the latest one. Um, yeah. And uh, my, the, my next book, in fact, is a novel uh, which comes out early next year, and it's called The Therapist. It's about a, oh. a, a, a maverick psychotherapist, so people might get some fun out of that. 
Wow, that sounds really fascinating. I love a, a good novel, so I'm definitely going to keep an eye out for that when that comes out. Um, thank you so much again, Hugh. This has been such a joy. And you know, despite all the technical difficulties, here we are. We finally got through um, the session with all these amazing insights. And I cannot wait for um, you know your next book. And <coughs> definitely stay in touch with you to find out more about your work. And yeah, really appreciate your time today. Such Thank great you very much, Lou. You. It's, it's yeah. been a great pleasure talking to you. I appreciate your interest in my work. Thank you. You've been listening to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights Podcast, produced by the Happiness Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at ha.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Lu Ngo. Thanks for tuning in.